Hi everybody, Nolan here, uh, and we are continuing our uh, series of lessons uh, on juncos. And so what we've been looking at is how how have the juncos changed since they arrived at UCSD and started breeding all year round, uh, and what does that mean about the environments? What does that mean about these populations? Are the populations changing? How are they changing? What's the mechanism? Why are they changing? Uh, so this is sort of our central question. Uh, is, is is why, you know, how are these populations changing and why? So what we really want to be able to do is to say, well, what are the differences between the populations? We've got our juncos, we've got our, uh, from uh, UCSD, we have our juncos from Laguna Mountain. How are they different? So I want to start us off with a warm-up question. Uh, now you're going to need your student activity sheets. Uh, they look like this. And we're going to start on page 71 of that file. Uh, lesson 11a, what exactly makes these juncos city birds? Uh, so that's where <coughs> we're going to start off. And the first question that I want you to take a moment to, to sort of jot down a, an answer to, a response, is what about the environment, specifically on the UCSD campus, might make it easier or harder for juncos to survive and reproduce? What is it about that environment? Uh, that can affect their survival or their reproduction when you compare UCSD to Laguna Mountain. Now keep in mind, you have your climate graphs that you already created. You have your, um, your, your Google Street View that you did, and we've watched parts of this video. So you should have a pretty good sense for what kinds of things might affect how well these populations can survive and reproduce. So before you do anything else, pause the video, respond to that question on your student activity sheet. All right, so now that you've answered that question, you've started to brainstorm a little bit about what might make it easier for the Juncos to survive on the UCSD campus, um, let's go ahead and watch about uh, three minutes or so of the video that we looked at earlier, the, uh, the Vimeo video. Uh, so the link is right there. It's also in the information section of this video. What I'd like you to go ahead and do is watch uh, about 8.07 all the way up until 11.23, or about, approximately. Uh, don't go past that. Just watch these three minutes, and then I'm going to have you respond to a few more questions uh, about how these juncos compare. So before you do anything else, open up this, this video and watch 807 through 1123, specifically keeping in mind what kinds of things might be different between these populations of birds. All right, now that you've watched that video, very interesting video, you saw that uh, there are differences between these populations. <clears throat> um, in terms not only of how much they're breeding, uh, but in terms of how the, uh, in particular, how the males behave um, and uh, in, in their interactions with their environment and in their interactions with each other and with people. Uh, so on uh, page 71 of your student activity sheets uh, is this little table, and it asks you how are city juncos different from mountain juncos, and then how might this difference impact the juncos' interactions with the environment? What we saw in the video, uh, if you watch those three minutes, was that the uh, males are doing some interesting things. They are less aggressive, uh, so instead of you know being really you know aggressive toward each other, they're they're a little bit nicer. Uh, they have less black and white color on them, uh, which is also a sh display of aggression. Uh, and uh, not only that, they're actually better dads. They t they seem much more interested in taking care of their broods of offspring rather than going and finding new mates, uh, which might maybe have something to do with why they're having so many offspring. They're just better dads. So uh, I do want you to take a moment uh, again to, to kind of pause, and if you haven't already, look at page 71 on your student activity sheets, uh, and go ahead, fill in some of these ideas. I, I mentioned some of them just now. Jot down how are these juncos different, and then how might this affect uh, how they interact with their environment? Uh, in all parts of their envir environment, maybe food and water, but also things like predators. Uh, predators were mentioned in the video. Um, with people, how might the birds actually interact differently with, with people? Um, so just pause, take a minute, make sure that both sides of this table are, are completed with some ideas. All right, we're just cruising right along. Um, the next thing that we want to do is really kind of the interesting part. We want to start to make predictions based on those few things that you just uh, took a look at in that table. How are these juncos differently? 
uh, how are these populations different? <clears throat> what we want to be able to do is start making predictions using a really interesting prediction tool. Uh, and, and if you didn't, if you weren't in class when we did this, I want you to just kind of follow along with me and just kind of make some predictions about how these juncos behave. So you can find these documents that I'm going to show you on this screen uh, either on my website or you can go and find this link, which is in the information portion of this video. Uh, and if you, I don't know if you need a Google account or not to use this, but if, if you don't have one, you should get one. Um, try to open this up and see if you can't access these graph documents that I'm going to show you on the screen because it's going to be helpful if you have that in front of you. Um, or you can just use the one that I handed out to you in class. So let's make some predictions. This is a really interesting figure. So in the video it mentions that the birds are behaving differently when, when uh, in, in the UCSD campus. They're actually behaving a little differently than the, the mountain birds. And so this diagram is, is really useful because it we can use it to sort of relatively compare the distances that birds respond to certain stimuli. So in this case, I'm going to come up to the screen here. So we see that in this case, the stimulus is a person, right? So uh, we've got our bird and, and there's a person around. And this diagram is trying to sort of illustrate um, these, these relative lengths of reactions. So uh, if you have the paper, you see that there's these sort of abbreviated uh, little little terms here. Uh, you can see them at the bottom of the screen right here. But what this diagram is showing is that, all right, let's say that you are this far from a junco. <clears throat> what it means is that that junco, uh, you are beyond that junco's line of sight. Because the junco can only see you once you get to here. So our, these two little uh, eyes right here um, are, are our juncos are, uh, who can see you. So as soon as you get closer than that arrow, the junco can see you. As soon as you get closer than this one, that means that the junco's heart rate starts to go up. And the reason for that is that the junco is getting nervous. He sees that you're close, and he says, oh, gee, I, I'm, I'm, I got to keep my eye on him. Uh, if you get this close to the junco, the junco is going to start making noise. It's going to start chitter-chattering and chirping and singing uh, either to uh, scare you off or maybe to alert other juncos that, hey, you know, there's somebody here. And as soon as you get that close, the junco flies away. You're just way too close for comfort. He's getting really nervous. He says, I got to get out of here. So that's what this diagram is showing. And we are going to uh, sort of assume uh, that these black lines that are being shown are the Laguna Mountain birds. Right? These are the juncos that we find in the Laguna Mountains, are the black arrows. So we can use this diagram in order to make a prediction. Do we think that the juncos that live at UCSD are going to uh, respond to shorter distances from a person or longer distances? Now it says in the video that they're bolder, that these birds are bolder. So what does that mean about their responses? What does that mean about how close you have to get in order to elicit these responses? So <clears throat> if we think about this first arrow, this DD. Uh, this is when the bird first sees you. So do we think that the bird is going to see you from a greater or shorter distance on the UCSD campus? Well, maybe if there's a bunch of buildings in the way and there's people or there's you know objects and obstacles all over the place, maybe you think that this distance is actually uh, sh uh, shorter. That in order for a UCSD bird to see you, you have to be closer to it. If that's the case, then you would put your arrow there. Um, maybe you think that they'll see you from the same exact distance. If that's the case, then you'll make your arrow the same length. Or maybe, for whatever reason, you think that the junco will see you from a farther distance. That means that you're going to extend your arrow. So we can use this as a predictions tool in order to think, well, based on uh, what we know about these birds, are they going to see us and respond closer or farther away? So the UCSD campus birds, uh, are they going to uh, get nervous when you're closer, when you're the same distance, or when you're farther away? What about uh, them starting to sing? Are they going to start singing when you're closer, when you're about the same distance, or when you're farther away? Same thing for flying. Are they going to fly when you're closer, same distance, or farther away? So I do want you to take a few minutes to just kind of um, take a look at that figure, that diagram, and, and make a few predictions 
about, you know, with another color, uh, how do you think these arrows are going to compare? So if our, our new color is UCSD, do you think these birds are going to respond when you're closer or when you're farther away? If they respond when you're closer, that means that they're actually um, not as scared of you. If they respond when you're farther away, it means that they're actually a little bit more scared. So go ahead and do that if you haven't uh, with this figure. And then after we do this, we're going to look at what do some of the data say as far as these populations go. All right, so what do our data actually tell us? There's two graphs that I want us to look at. They're really interesting graphs. Um, this is the first one, 11A.2. And this graph <clears throat> shows some data that's been collected um, from the birds uh, by uh, uh, Pamela Ye and other students that have been working on campus. And what we can see here is that these, this is a really interesting graph because we've got these gray bars which represent Mount Laguna birds. We have these black bars that represent the uh, UCSD birds. Um, these numbers I think are just sample sizes so you don't have to worry about those. Kind of like the climate graphs, we see there's two axes here. We see there's one on the left uh, which is our uh, flight initiation distance for foraging birds. So how close do you have to get for the bird to fly away when it's collecting food? Over here, we find a different group of birds, the same species, same populations, um, but instead we're looking at a different behavior. All right, when females are sitting on a nest incubating eggs, how close do you have to get in order to actually scare them away? I want you to stop and I want you to look at this graph and try to interpret it. Before I say anything else, please pause the video, and look at this, and think, well, what does this graph show? So take a minute to pause, please. Okay, now that you've given your chance yourself a chance to kind of think through that, let's um, consider how what is this graph showing. It looks like our Mount Laguna birds um, respond from a much greater distance than our UCSD birds. So the San Diego birds at UCSD, you have to get within just about four meters of them before they actually fly away. Uh, the mountain birds, you just get within, you know, 13 meters and they fly away. The mountain birds are really scaredy cats. The UCSD birds, you have to get pretty darn close in order to actually get them nervous enough to fly. Uh, same thing with the incubating females. You have to get within 40 centimeters, 0.4 meters, for that bird to actually get out of there and say, I, this isn't worth it, I have to get out of here. Um, but for the mountain birds, <clears throat> they'll fly after you're just a meter away. So it looks like from this graph that our Mount Laguna birds will not let you get anywhere near as close as the UCSD birds. Um, not a very complicated graph, but it's a little complicated if you don't know how to, to read it. So this talks about these, these um, you know, two different behaviors of birds and two different groups of birds. Let's go ahead and look at some, some time data, some um, uh, sort of longitudinal data, if you will. This is another really interesting graph. This graph is generalized from birds in general. This isn't necessarily talking about uh, juncos in particular, but it's a scatter plot. And what this graph is showing us is that if you go farther back in generations, birds will tend, uh, that in generations of birds that are living in a city, birds from a hundred generations ago tend to not let you get very close. So this is our relative flight distance. The higher up, the farther they, uh, you are when they fly, the lower down, the closer you are when they fly. What we can see here is that if you go farther back into the past, these birds are scaredy cats. These birds will fly away when you are, you know, fairly far from them. These ones that are modern day, that in the present, these ones will fly away. You have to get really close for them to fly away. So that's what this graph is showing. It's a scatter plot. It's almost like a line graph. Uh, but in this case, it's showing, you know, over these generations, how are the behaviors of our birds changing? So are these consistent or not with the predictions that you made with this diagram? Are they consistent or not? So before we end, uh, I just want you to go ahead and refer um, to the uh, pages in our uh, student activity sheets. Um, and I believe that that is page uh, 73. And uh, what I'd like you to go ahead and do is to answer these questions. Uh, based on the figures, what differences do you notice between UCSD and Laguna Juncos? How does the information compare with your prediction? What do you see in that scatter plot? Do you think that scatter plot applies to our juncos? It's just talking about birds in general. Do you think that it applies to our juncos? And then what other questions do you still have about the junco populations? 
So once you do all that, I hope that you're able to kind of compare how these two different populations are behaving a little bit differently.